Hello, my name's Ben. Welcome to Reading Museum and this tour of the Bayer Tapestry in celebration of Ken Follett's new book, The Evening and the Morning. In 1885, a group of 35 women from Northern England in a town called Leek decided that they were going to make their own copy of the Bayer Tapestry. And it went on a world tour all across Europe, America, and to South Africa as well. So it was bought in Reading and went on display. And despite going on a few um, world tours after that, it's been in Reading ever since, and it's one of our most fascinating and well-respected objects. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story of the Bear Tapestry. What we're really gonna focus on today is the fascinating history and insights into the medieval world that you can see peppered throughout the tapestry in the main scenes, but also in some of the fascinating borders that you can get to know as well. So, coming to the story of the original tapestry, it shows scenes that start in the year 1064 and go on until the Battle of Hastings in 1066, which is the climax and the end of the tapestry. The original Bayer tapestry would have been made by skilled female embroiderers, probably in England, and it's thought to be in or near St. Augustine's in Canterbury. We know almost nothing about them, but they would probably have embroidered the outlines of the figures, and then another embroiderer would have embroidered the inner figures that would have added the colour. It's this colour that's one of the great vibrant things about the Bayer Tapestry, and it's a really vibrant piece of work. You'll notice that the horses are blue, red, green. They have different coloured legs from their body. They're not meant to be beige and boring. It's not just a story. It's meant to be an epic tale that you can see and really understand. The Bayer Tapestry is a fascinating work of art and there are over 620 figures. A few of them are named. You've got the main characters, you've got Harold Godwinson, whose surname comes from the fact that he was Godwin's son, Earl Godwin, who was a leading figure in the early uh, 11th century. Then you've got King Edward the Confessor, King of England. You've got William, Duke of Normandy, and his brother, Bishop Odo of Bayeux, who's thought to be the man who commissioned the original tapestry, who paid for it to be designed and probably worked with a designer to make sure that the scenes were exactly how he wanted. Because at the end of the day, the Bayer Tapestry is riddled with Norman propaganda. It shows the Normans in a great light. The Bayer Tapestry starts with King Edward the Confessor, one of King Ethelred Unraid's youngest sons, sitting on his throne speaking to his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson. And Harold Godwinson you can see all the way through the tapestry because he's got a very fashionable moustache and then hair which seems to be like a mullet. So Edward is seen with a longer beard and long hair and then later point of the tapestry he's seen with really long grey hair to show he's aged. So Edward is sitting there with his crown, with a scepter, but also his chair that he's sitting on isn't just a throne. Chairs during the medieval period were pretty rare. And throughout the Bayer Tapestry, they show signs of someone being wealthy and important. Most people wouldn't have sat on a chair. They would have had a stool, or if they were sitting down to a communal feast, they'd probably have sat on a bench or maybe even the floor. So it's all these elements that show wealth status and power. You can see them all the way through the Bayer Tapestry. And part of this is the retinue, all the servants that an important person has. So Harold Godwinson is shown preparing to sail across to Normandy on a diplomatic mission. And he's there with his hawk, he's hunting, he's got his hunting dogs ready, but he's also got a lot of servants with him. Now these would have been soldiers, professional men, who had decided to fight for him because they thought that they could get promoted. And there are others who would have been ordinary servants, people who would have worked in the kitchens and would have done the more menial tasks. 
Unfortunately, some of these would also have been slaves and unfree peasants who would have effectively been owned by their lord. Harold then goes on this journey and you can see his servants in the lower borders. Some of them are farming and you can see a bit about the sort of farming machinery that they would, would have used in the medieval period. Now farming machinery was also really expensive so most communities would have worked together. They might have had one plough between a few of them that they would have worked on and they would have used uh, quite a lot of strip farming as well. So people would have worked together in a community. Most of the communities that you see are a few buildings. Now part of this is to make it a bit more simple to see but a lot of it is because communities were small, they were spread out, there was still a lot of woodland around towns, villages and cities and this was great for hunting which was a real pastime for the nobility but if you were an ordinary person you might work as a beater or help chase away some of the bears, boars and stags that the nobility would have pursued. You may also have poached some of them for yourself, especially if you were starving. But the problem with this was that there were pretty serious and grim laws for anyone caught poaching. These became even harsher after the Norman Conquest in 1066, where people could lose hands or even be executed for poaching. It was a really hard time in the medieval period, and that's one thing you have to remember. The Bear Tapestry might seem really friendly and pretty in places, but it's a grim time, and some of the battle scenes show that so well, where people are having um, their mail stripped from their bodies and, and things. So it's a really grim story in parts. So you can see a farming scene here, where a man has a sling that he's using to scare away birds, basically like a human scarecrow. Now this was often done by boys who would have had a slingshot and would have thrown it to scare away any birds in the fields. So they would have been um, working a very hard day where um, probably working on the land as well as also being prepared to fire a slingshot at any birds that you could see. Then we get to these two boys here who are butchers. They're part of the Norman army and they're working alongside the other men to um, kill the captured cattle that they've taken. Now, throughout the tapestry, you see children in roles that are really exactly the same as adults. And part of that is because there weren't really any medieval schools. There were some if you were entering the church, but if you were an ordinary person, you would normally just work with your parents. If they were farmers, you worked with them in the fields. If they were a blacksmith, you'd work with them um, in their forge. So you can see Harold here. He's got a cloak on and it's held in the corner by a brooch. So this is a slightly earlier Anglo-Saxon brooch. It's a replica that would have been worn on the shoulder and a cloak would have covered you and it would have served like a waterproof coat does today. If you're wealthy, you're wearing the best cloak that you can afford. And this was the case for the medieval period. You wore the best equipment you could, you had the best clothes you could, and you kept up with the fashions. And this weren't for the ordinary people as well you'd have the best brooches you could afford. If you could afford a bronze brooch, you'd have a bronze brooch in the best and current style. And if you were wealthier, you'd have a silver or gold brooch. Things like amber were really popular as well. And you'd have crosses and amulets made from um, wood, horn, amber and metal. And throughout the tapestry, you can see uh, some of the detail on things like the stirrups that they would have worn that would have been the height of fashion at the time and these survive archaeologically and they're often connected to things like roaring beasts and monsters from the key artwork of the time. A lot of this was linked to the Vikings and was uh, heavily influenced by Scandinavian artwork at the time. So the Normans are sporting a completely different haircut 
to the Anglo-Saxons, the back of their head is completely shaved. So that section of the head is completely cut short, bare to the skin, and then the front is left to grow a bit long. Now this was quite a fearsome fashion. Um, it's quite regimented, would have made soldiers instantly recognisable. But also it's a sort of fashion that some of the Vikings would have had as well, to have shorter hair, to look a bit more fearsome. We sometimes think of the Dark Ages as a time of brutality and everything's ugly, people are unwashed and unkempt, but we know from archaeology that things like combs were incredibly prevalent. So men would have been combing their hair, combing their beards, and looking as good as they could be. Not just going into battle and sort of terrifying their enemies, but they would have wanted to be as fashionable and good looking as they possibly could be. So this replica of a medieval shoe is exactly the same as some from Viking York. It's the same styles in the Bayer Tapestry that they would have had 30 or 40 years earlier. But also, this one is quite simple. Some were really elaborate and you'd have a boot and embroidery um, on part of it as well particularly if you worked for the church. Now, during the medieval period, you only really ate meat when you could afford it. And the wealthy ate meat on a regular basis. And this was part of showing they were wealthy. But if you were an ordinary person, if you were poor, you didn't have meat very often. You might get a bit of fish, but most of the time, you'd have had more bland vegetable stews and lots and lots of bread. And all the way through the Bear Tapestry, you can see people um, feasting and having meals. You can see um, pieces of bread that they're eating. And there are also a scene where it shows people baking bread, just ready for the army to eat, feasting in the field. Separately, we've got William the Conqueror with his brothers. They're feasting together. They're having an absolutely fantastic meal that's just been made for them by their servants. They would be having the best quality meat that they could, and they'd also be having the best wine that's been brought over. And you can see a couple of people transporting wine, wine barrels over. This is all part of making uh, their life as comfortable as possible. This is a horn, and this would have been what a lot of people would have drunk alcohol from in the medieval period. So you'd have filled it up and you'd have been able to drink from it and you can see throughout the tapestry in the feasting scenes people drinking from horns and there was a lot of communal drinking that, uh, that went on. It was part of the hall life. So you would tell stories and you would drink and in the dark of winter you would be told stories like Beowulf and other horrors that, uh, that would get you through the long cold winter nights. One of the next key things that we see throughout the tapestry are people um, going on ships and these voyages are shown in a very clean cleanly light. There's a section later on that has a, um, the Norman army travelling onto their ships. You can see men hitching up um, their skirts to get on board and bring their horses along. What's completely ignored is that this was a horrible voyage. It was really stormy, really grim, the ships all got separated and the horses would have been terrified. Nothing is shown about mucking out the, the ships afterwards from everything that the horses had left for their owners. It doesn't show the grim plight of the servants and the serving boys who were working on the ships at the time. But what it does show are all the people loading the ships just beforehand. You've got huge loaves of bread, massive vats of wine, and all the chain mail that their uh, masters would have worn. Now, we've got the great Norman fleet bringing William's army that he's raised to conquer England. These are exactly the same sorts of ships that the Vikings used to raid England. They were clinker built, so this is where the wooden um, planks are laid over each other. 
and this meant that they were more secure and could travel faster and they could get slightly bigger ships as well. So this is the Norman heritage that uh, they had from the Vikings coming to the fore. And you can see the ships going across from Normandy to England, across the English Channel, and a few in the background are deliberately embroidered to be smaller. Now this is the perspective that you can see in the tapestry coming to the fore. So the whole idea is that you're not seeing one static image. It's meant to be flowing. It's meant to be a really interesting gripping tail that you're looking at. So this is the sort of axe that they would have used during the medieval period to make ships. And you can see a few scenes in the Bayer tapestry of carpenters cutting down strips of wood to make into the ships that would have transported the Normans across. Now it's the younger men who are shown cutting down all the wood and it's the older, more experienced master shipbuilders with their longer beards who are finishing off all of the ships and who are caulking. But it's this sort of axe with a thinner blade that um, would have been used to cut planks. And if you were a member of the feared, this is the sort of weapon that you would have taken with you. You wouldn't have specialist military equipment. You take whatever was to hand. So if you were a carpenter or you were a woodsman, you would have taken a wood axe with you to fight. One of the key scenes of the Bayer Tapestry is the burial of King Edward the Confessor in January 1066. And you can see him being taken in his coffin to Westminster Abbey, which is one of the few stone buildings that would have been around in Anglo-Saxon England. There were stone churches and other official buildings, but most were made out of wood. They were constructed normally as smaller buildings. You didn't get that many two or three story buildings, normally on a smaller scale. So Westminster Abbey would have dwarfed anything around it. It would have been spectacular to anyone that saw it and it had literally just been finished at the end of 1066. So from about the start of year about a thousand castles were being built in Normandy but they're not really found in England. You get fortified halls belonging to wealthy lords and then you get burrs, earthen fortresses that people could escape to and could be held out against a Viking incursion. So if the Vikings have invaded and uh, you've seen their ships coming down, the, um, coming down the river, you could escape into a burr with your lord and be protected there. They were temporary fortresses. Often things like old Iron Age forts were reused and then others were built up. And then some of these... Um, actually in, ended up becoming towns. So places like Peterborough might have come from a nearby burr. So burr became borough. If the kingdom was ever invaded, you were called up to fight as part of the militia. Now this was called the feared, and this contained everyone from uh, blacksmiths, um, farmers to the wealthiest people um, who weren't in the army. They would be the officer class and the ordinary people would be conscripted to go and fight with their lord. So you can see this scene here is a few members of the feared fighting fiercely at the Battle of Hastings. You see they haven't got any armour on and this is because they're probably poorer warriors and the militia soldiers who only have a shield and a spear and maybe a scythe they've taken from the farm to fight with them. These were exactly the same people who were fighting the Vikings when they invaded. You'd have a lord, get his soldiers together, and then he'd gather the feared to go and defeat the Viking band that had invaded and was threatening their town. So we see here a great portrayal of the shield wall, the type of fighting that the Anglo-Saxons and Vikings were involved in. This was a really brutal tactic where men would stand side by side laying their shields over each other and they would fight until one side was eventually weakened and forced to run. If you were a soldier in the medieval period, you would have had a spear like this. This would have been used by the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. It's a longer range weapon. 
They would also had a shorter knife or um, a sax with them that they could have fought with as well. So this is a brutal piece of equipment. It would have probably stood taller than I am, maybe about seven foot tall, and give you a long reach to attack the enemy with. So this is the sort of equipment that the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings were using when fighting each other. This chainmail was worn by the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans and the Vikings. There were little variations, things like the length of mail, and sometimes a coif like this was built into the shirt, but it's very similar. The armaments, armour, shields, weapons are all very similar from the Normans, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings. And then you would have worn this sort of helmet on, on top of that so to give you extra protection so this this is well known as a norman helmet but this sort of simple conical style would have been very popular in the medieval period So thank you for joining me on this tour and we welcome you to Reading Museum and look forward to seeing you in the future.